Middle of the country, but not middle of the road opinions. It's the podcast dedicated to sports in the air capital of the world. I'm going to Wichita. Wichita, Kansas, and beyond. With Tommy Castor, Weston Mills, and Blake Cripps. This is Keeper of the Games. Some may say we're only mildly entertaining. Some may say we are wildly unqualified. I say we are exactly where we need to be, helping you and the Chiefs kingdom in Wichita recover from a disappointing loss by the Chiefs in Super Bowl 55. I'm, I'm told by our crack legal staff that I must inform you of the following. The Keeper of the Games podcast is not a licensed therapist, and we are not authorized to provide any financial advice Listener discretion is advised. With that, we welcome you into episode 53 of the Keeper of the Games podcast, still ranked in the top 25 Wichita sports podcasts in the country, but just barely. I'm Blake Cripps, joined (laughs) once again by Tommy Castor, who is playing the role of the elder brother, who realizes he can't pick on his younger siblings anymore with his bad opinions. Wow, that's quite an intro. Um, I think I can can still pick on my younger siblings. I mean, Um, I just choose. That's only because you cheat. Well, fair enough, but I choose to just be nicer today and give up the reins of hosting yet again to you. And Weston Mills will be the poor mother cowering in the corner, seeing two siblings about to fight in the backyard, powerless to stop it. Hey, I, I rode the middle of the fence last time. I'll do the same thing as as the mother watching her children play. That, Is it comfy no up there? Do, like, do you get a discounted rate when you sleep up there on the fence? Oh yeah, you bet. I, I get I get fans from both sides liking me, and you know that I'm, I'm all about the popularity <laughs> yeah. contest. That 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 you are. And if you'd like to make us more popular, you can visit our website cogsports.com. That's k o g sports.com. Of course, the podcast is available almost in every single way that it can be available on the internet. Maybe except on MySpace. The best way, of course, is cogpod.podomatic.com or on our website, Spotify, Google, Apple, Stitcher. There's there's probably more. And, of course, if you dare, you can always watch the show on YouTube and Facebook. Search for Keeper of the Games. Make sure you like and follow us when you do. Coming up on the show, Kansas basketball drops out but bounces back. Wichita State guts one out. And Wichita uh, Wichita North makes a change. But we begin today, of course, with the Kansas City Chiefs falling in Super Bowl 55, 31-9 to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And guys, watching this game, I thought that the Chiefs were right in it early. And if you look at the win track, the win predictions, the percentage chance that the Chiefs and Buccaneers had to win the game, it wasn't in the Buccaneers' favor until the second quarter. I thought the Chiefs came out strong, played good defense in the first quarter, and for a lot of the first half. But when you set a new Super Bowl record for penalties, and we may want to get into that, um, you know that's not going to help your cause at all. And I, I felt like the Chiefs in this game got exposed in the line play. Tampa Bay won the battle up front. Patrick Mahomes with a bad toe that's going to require surgery, as it turns out, never had the time that Tom Brady did. And... You can't necessarily blame the guys who are in there. I mean, let's be honest. Mike Remmers and Andrew Wiley had terrible, terrible games for the Chiefs. But let's think about this for a second. Mitchell Schwartz, out. Eric Fisher just went out. The Chiefs lost Osemele earlier this year and did not have the doctor as he stepped away to treat coronavirus patients in Canada. So this could have been a much different offensive line for Kansas City. You had guys playing out of position. Shaquille Barrett was a freaking nightmare for the Buccaneers. And just looking at the entire game, Patrick Mahomes did not have as good a decision-making as we normally see. He was a little tentative on that foot. He was under pressure. The receivers dropped passes. No matter what you think about everything else in the game, to me, Tommy, And Tom Brady actually said this in the Westwood One radio coverage before the game. The best team is not the one that wins the Super Bowl. I will take Kansas City over that Tampa Bay team 99 times out of 100. I'll take them 100 times out of 100. I'll die. I still got my shirt on. I paid way too much for it, and I was happy to, and I would have done it again. I will take Kansas City over any football team in the history of football, but... It's not the best team that wins. It's the team that plays best on that day. And in my mind, there's no question 
Tampa Bay was the best team on the field on that one Sunday. Would they be next week? Not necessarily. But on that day, Tampa Bay was the better team, and they deserve to win. Blake, I got to give a hat tip to Joshua Briscoe from Sports Radio 810 in Kansas City. He tweeted after the game, probably the most succinct and complete recap in 140 characters that that I've ever seen. And and I want to read it for you uh, verbatim because I just think it sums it up so well. The Chiefs got no pressure, gave Mahomes no protection, and had major mistakes from Hill, Kelsey, Jones, and Reed, plus some arguable but nonetheless extremely untimely penalties. If there was a blueprint for a Super Bowl Super Bowl blowout, that's what it would be. And I absolutely agree with Joshua Briscoe again from Sports Radio 810 in Kansas City. That is this that's the Super Bowl blowout recipe, the blueprint right there. And and Tampa Bay came out with their game plan. We we spent so much time on last week's show talking about what's Kansas City's game plan going to be. What's it going to look like? How are they going to attack? We really didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about what Tampa Bay's game plan was going to look like to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. What that game plan was they executed it perfectly against the Chiefs. There was nothing that Kansas City could do for the majority of that game because Tampa Bay just had complete control on both sides of the football. And I agree with you, Blake, and I know we're going to get into the nitty gritty of this in just a little bit, but really it comes down to the line play for me first and foremost. Uh, It was a lesson, I think, in showing how important line play is in the National Football League to be a successful team on, on both sides of the ball. And it was great for Tampa Bay, and it was really bad for Kansas City. That wasn't the only reason that the Chiefs lost the game, but it sure was a huge contributing factor when you look at the amount of times that Patrick Mahomes was under duress in that game. There was I I don't know if there was a single snap that Patrick Mahomes took where he was not under pressure and where the pocket did not collapse. It happened pretty much every time. In fact, you know the stat came out after the game that it was the most times that a, a quarterback had been pressured in a Super Bowl game ever in all time. That was the game plan for the Buccaneers. They knew that Kansas City was dealing with injuries on the offensive line. They knew that that, that the Chiefs had to play some reserve guys on the line, both due to opt-outs and season-ending injuries, and they exploited that all day long. Patrick Mahomes is Superman, but he's only one man. He can only do so much, and he did everything that he possibly could in that game. I mean, you think of some of those circus throws that he tried to complete, a couple of which which he almost did had it not been for the that should have the been passes. completed. Yes. Abs- absolutely. Uh, he did everything that he possibly could. But there, like you said last week, Blake, when you were talking about the legacy of Patrick Mahomes, uh, you know, in the Super Bowl, and you said the last time you checked, there were 11 other guys on the field. Well, that's exactly the case. And Patrick Mahomes could only do so much. So I know that there's a lot more to break and down. Five of them play on the offensive line. More last about I, exactly last I what had happened. But at the end of the day, that's really what it came down to was that Tampa Bay had a perfect game plan to beat Kansas City. They had a game plan unlike what anybody else has ever done against the Chiefs, and it worked to perfection for them. You know, Tommy, I. I think you you mentioned something, you know, you well, and I guess it was uh, Josh Briscoe's his thoughts and blueprint, but and that encompasses the game as a whole. But really, if you look at what happened with the Chiefs on offense, something that we just have really never seen since Patrick Mahomes took over as quarterback for this team, it really it was that again a perfect storm, even just for the offense. And there's there's a couple of things. One, you know, Blake already mentioned the offensive line, but I, I, I do want to kind of even dive a little bit deeper in that because, you know, obviously we had Eric Fisher out at left tackle. We had Mitch Schwartz out at right tackle. We had Laurent Duvernay Tardif out at left guard. We had um actually let me let me say Laurent Duvar Duvernay Tardif out at right guard. We had Kaleche Osimile out at left guard. Um, then from there, Mike Rimmers was actually starting the season as a guard. He is forced into playing left tackle and Andrew Wiley, who was playing guard is forced to play right tackle. So now not only are both of these individuals potentially backups to start the season, but now they're being asked to not only play, but play in a position that they do not normally play. And let me tell you, playing guard is very different than playing tackle especially at the NFL level in when you in in which a game in which you have some of the most premier pass rushers 
in the NFL. Um, and then from there, you know, a couple of names that we that we also mentioned, you know, have failed to, to forget about too. Martinez Rankin, who is a guy that they picked up last year who they've really expected to be healthy and he's just never gotten there yet. But from everything I've read and heard, you know, he is a guy that they've it just have expected to be a contributor. And then also the the early draft pick that they had in Lucas Niang, I think they certainly expected New- Lucas Niang to contribute right away as well. And he, you know, he opted out in the beginning of the season. So this was uh, I mean you just cannot at some point your offensive line is going to break when you continuously erode it the way it does but as we all saw what happened not being able to give Pat the time not being able to run that office not being able to go through progressions it so that right there already is going to struggle uh, make an offense struggle to be able to throw the ball deep, which Kansas City likes to do from time to time. Th- certainly, if you've watched this offense, they're going to take what, what is given to them, but they like those big plays. They like to go over the top. That's how they get Tyreek Hill involved, which allows everything underneath to open up. So now you don't have time to do that. But but then really with the speed on wi- at wide receiver, you can still get that off if you're Kansas City, especially if you've got the arm of Patrick Mahomes. Tampa Bay set in cover four all night. They had... They had two safeties in the middle of the field and their corners playing deep. And I don't know how many times, if you guys noticed the shots of where their safeties were lining up, they had safeties lining up at 15 yards depth to, to almost deeper than that at times. That is absurd. I mean, the respect they show for the, the speed of the wide receivers, but you're never going to be able to get over the top when safeties are already playing that deep. And the corners were even off that much at times. So I, I think in that kind of, I, I point that out because, it segues into the second thing that I think really frustrated me was was really a lack of adjustment by Andy Reid and the and the coaching staff. And of course, I, I mean, I'm hand up, very aware. I have not watched game film. I don't know if if I missed something that that they were seeing, but it just felt like we never really saw that adjustment. And and, and you did kind of see a shift a little bit in the second half of, of them trying to work the ball to Travis Kelsey a little bit more. But why we weren't seeing Tyreek Hill on short routes, you know, Sammy Watkins, I don't know. I mean, he was out there. Was he healthy? Was he not? Uh, You know, I I told you we saw a couple of looks from Byron Pringle. I I just don't understand why there was no adjustment to work the middle of the field, to work that short route, to work some bubble routes, to do something to tell those cornerbacks, hey, okay, fine, you can play 15 yards off the field, off the ball, but we're going to get the ball out to our wide receivers, and then that's going to that's going to be five like that, quick pops. We're going to move the ball down the field and, and and make no adjustment. And then the third thing, because we are continuously playing from behind, because we failed to make lack of adjustment, because our our offensive line wasn't giving Pat protection, because Tampa Bay's offense was doing well. That just all that did was make that front seven, that front four even more ferocious because they knew we were in a position to, to we were going to throw the ball so they could just pin their heels ears back and not have to worry about trying to react to the run and you saw when we ran the ball in the second half it was incredibly effective but at that point they didn't care they said okay fine go ahead and take a seven yard run that let that clock run you're playing too far behind to let this happen so i mean it was that perfect storm of, of things that all fell so quickly into place on that offense that just made it, you know, just unbearable for Pat to be able to try to navigate it and get out of. And, um, you know, it's, I think it was incredibly frustrating to watch. It's just something that we had not seen really from this team was that, you know, the coach standpoint or, or from the offense to just struggle the way it was. But, you know, I guess ultimately you can only expect to get so far with um, you know, the offensive line when you're playing, you know, guys that might've been on a practice squad <laughs> come start the season had you had your full, full group of guys. So, um, and that's not to take away from those guys. It's not that they're not very, I mean, you know, I mean, they're all still, still on an NFL roster. Everybody that makes the NFL is incredibly talented, but you know, it, Mike Rimmers isn't Eric Fisher and Andrew Wiley is not Mitchell Schwartz and, Stiff Stephen Wesnuski, you know, is not Laurent Laurent Duvernay Tardif. It, it just is what it is, and then I've said it from day one: the best way to beat Patrick Mahomes is when you can when you can get to the quarterback by only rushing four. It allows to put everybody in coverage, and it makes it just a little bit easier to cover that talented group of skills players. And that's exactly what we saw on Sunday. 
I don't necessarily disagree with anything that you said, except for maybe that they didn't try to get Tyreek Hill and Kelsey involved. I mean, they had 25 of the 49 targets that Patrick Mahomes had in the game. So I would push back a little bit on that. I would have liked to have seen Kansas City run the football a little bit more. They averaged 10 yards per carry in the game. So I think that there was that there were some seams there that and some plays to be had. Uh, the the biggest thing that that I thought, and it, and it's not necessarily the biggest thing, I didn't think that Patrick Mahomes had the best decision making that we've ever seen. He's had he's been under pressure before, and I thought that there were a lot of times when he gave too much ground. He would circle back twenty yards, and especially knowing that he had you know a turf toe, a pretty serious injury that's going to require some surgery. It would have been great for him to try to get the ball out a little bit quicker out of his hand and, and try to find somebody open. I don't – I'm certainly not trying to blame Patrick Mahomes. He played his guts out, made a couple of incredible throws, and you know the rest of the offense has to wear some of this too. I mean, that early play, very early on, I think it was Tyreek Hill on a circus throw that, that, uh, that he made. I'm not saying it was an easy catch, but, I mean, it went through his hands of him in the face mask. That's a play that Tyreek Hill should make. We had one where Travis Kelsey was uh, had a guy around his feet, ball was up, and and they were, you know, about in his hands. And that's a play that Travis Kelsey, the best tight end that was going, maybe the best receiver in the NFL this year. That's a play you have to make to win the Super Bowl. So it's not all on the offensive line. The offensive line was bad, but I did I did think that the decision making for Patrick Mahomes was definitely a factor. The turf toe injury probably played into that. And obviously, it's much di- much more difficult to make decisions when you're under duress, when it seems like your pocket is collapsing every single time. So it's all part and parcel. I, I thought that Patrick Mahomes could have been better. He was under a lot of pressure. Offensive line did not help him out. And the offense didn't help the defense get stops in the second half by sustaining drives like they could have. And that's part of the reason why the Chiefs defense was really unable to get the key third down stop that they needed in the third quarter when you could still see that there was a possibility of coming back. And credit Tom Brady, too. Tom Brady had a fantastic game, phenomenal game, and he was much better protected than Mahomes was. The Chiefs had two hits on the quarterback in this game. Tampa Bay had eight and so it's a lot more easy to be Tom Brady when you're not moving around than it is when you're Patrick Mahomes and you're having to move around a lot on a bad foot, even if you are the far more mobile quarterback who has far more different throws in his arsenal. Uh, the Tampa Bay defense, you know, they they funneled the Chiefs away from what they want to do, and the Chiefs defense did not do a good enough job of taking away the things from Tampa Bay that the Buccaneers wanted to go to. You know, and, and, you know, and I, I think to, to kind of go back to uh, I just want to say really quick to go back to what you were saying about Mahomes and about, you know, how maybe he didn't have the best decision making process. And I know that you said, well, when he's under duress, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for him to do so. I guess my thought process is, yeah, I think we've seen Patrick Mahomes perform at this insane superhuman level for so long where these, you know, these, dis- these good decisions that he's making are then being completed on the other end or these crazy, ridiculous arm angle throws are just, we've gotten used to them just working every single time. This was the first time that they didn't really work. So I don't know if you can say, all right, well, Patrick Mahomes just, he didn't play a very good game versus, well, just the the things that normally, like normal quarterbacks don't do, he's been able to complete in the past. Right. And just in this particular game, he wasn't able to do it. So I, that's my only pushback on that. Weston, you were going to say? Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing too is you're, it's not just a matter of, you know, obviously he's running around, but I don't know if you're even, if we're even grasping how bad it was. So he was pressured on 29 of his 56 pass plays. That's 52% of his pass plays. He had pressure, which is the most for any quarterback in Super Bowl history. Um, and take that in comparison to Brady was pressured on four plays. And so, and again, Blake, you kind of touched on this. It, it, it isn't ever just one thing in the game of football. There's too many guys out there for it to be solely one thing, but across the board, 
you're not going to find anybody who who's going to who's not going to say that the offensive line didn't play poorly. They did. No. And part of it's I mean, I think played- we do we all agree that that was uh, at least offensively, defense is a different matter, but do we all agree that probably the offensive line was the biggest factor as to why the Chiefs did not score a touchdown? Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. how I don't know how you couldn't. And then, so and then my second part of it, so and as 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 I'm going back to this, hey, there's so many factors that go into it too. I mentioned the, the the play calling earlier too. And what I was really saying, Blake, is is not so much that they didn't try to get the ball to Travis Kelsey and Tyreek because they did. What I wanted to see was more short underneath pass plays to make those cornerbacks adjust. Or and it's not so much the cornerbacks because it's the play is the defensive play is called just like an offensive play is called, but to make that defensive coordinator for the Bucks adjust and, and make his guys come up a little bit more. Um, but really, so with the, with the chiefs offensive play calling also, I would have loved to see, you know, it, has anybody asked Andy Reed, Eric B why there were not adjustments made to help the offensive line? Why did we not see 12 personnel? Why do we not see Nick Kaiser or uh, I don't even know, Dion Yelder, whoever's this, the backup. Maybe the, the sausage. Anthony Sherman, yeah, absolutely. Anybody, you know, you get you put two tight ends on the field. Of course, we're not bringing Nick Kaiser on because I want to throw him the ball to set someone else in there to pass block. Why were we not yeah. putting, you know, like like you said, why would why are we not lining up with Daryl Williams in the backfield and Anthony Sherman? Of course, we're not throwing the ball to Anthony Sherman, even though we have, and I love it when we do. Uh, always good. For That's an interesting and, uh, point. Sa- Saucers pass. Why why did that? Why was that adjustment never there? I mean, there, there should have been, it should have taken two possessions to realize, hey, up front, it's just a mismatch, and that's okay. Look, we, we know who we have. We know their offensive, their, their defensive front is great. There should have been an adjustment. So, and then from there, and then the part that I don't, I don't think any, any of us, anybody with a casual eye, even, even, you know, top people who are covering the Chiefs are necessarily going to know, okay, you know, Pat after the game made some comments about a lot of it's on me. People just don't see it. I'm not buying it. He's going to make that comment no matter what. But to that degree, you know, hey, was he missing some hot routes? Was Is that part of it, right? And it's not really a – usually your your hot routes, your, your checks and those kind of things really come – with you know a blitz or a stunt um not when it's just the front four but still i mean pat as the quarterback there could have been definitely some adjustments some check downs some stuff that he could have done at the light of scrimmage to help with that himself even if the play's not called that way um but that you know that's something i purely would be speculating on because i don't know the design of each play what well, he missed some open throws to. too that he wasn't you know on plays that he wasn't being pressured there were some open throws that he that he makes he normally makes and he didn't and you know i think that there there is kind of a battle of attrition isn't there when you know i don't know how bad his toe was hurting was it bad enough to be a big deal i don't know if he's, he's having surgery on it, it must be at least it's not a no deal if he's having surgery on it in the off season but when you're forced to to consistently just retreat you know you 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 start Instead of reacting to the pressure, I think you're just expecting the pressure. And I don't necessarily think that that's a good thing. You, When you're a quarterback, you want to be able to have confidence. Okay, you know, when I want to step up and make a throw, yes, he can run around and do the razzle-dazzle and run straight back from the line of scrimmage and make something happen. But I think one of his best attributes is when he's running parallel to the line of scrimmage or forward. He can make those throws going toward the play. And obviously he, he did run the ball a few times. It was successful at it, but I believe that his percentage is much better when he's running parallel to the line or forward, not necessarily on the big bootlegs, especially when he's giving up 20 yards of field position to try to do it. But again, you know, the, the offensive line does have a, a major part of that, and they were a major reason why he had to do that. And when you have that much, you know, taxing, when you're taxed that much mentally and physically, I mean, it, it does make seeing the simple plays, you know, probably a lot more difficult. Hey, Blake, I do want to uh, to go back to a, a comment that Weston made a few minutes ago about yeah. the lack of adjustments, uh, you know, and, and I think that those adjustments, th- I think that's fair. I think that's fair criticism. And, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying I love Andy Reid. Uh, I think that Eric Bieniemy is a great offensive coordinator. I think that Steve Spagnola is a good defensive coordinator. I think that Dave Tobe is a great special teams coordinator. All four of those guys have won Super Bowl rings. 
but that doesn't make them immune from criticism either. And so I think that the the question about the lack of adjustments is fair. I also think a, a topic that we haven't touched on yet, and that's some of the game management, the clock management decisions in that game, especially at the end of the first half. I think that's incredibly fair criticism. Also, you know, you think about that, you go back to to that sequence at the end of the first half, you know, the, the Buccaneers have the ball with under a minute to go. The Chiefs are down by eight. If I'm Andy Reid and I know that Tom Brady is getting the football with under a minute to go, I've seen that movie too many times before. And I also know that I'm getting the ball back at the beginning of the second half. So why in the world are you calling timeouts? Why are you extending the drive for Tampa Bay? Of course, you know, there were some some crazy things that happened on that drive for Tampa Bay, including a long defensive pass interference on Bashad Breland, you know, but then, you know, th- there were just those those timeouts that were called that basically extend the drive for Tom Brady. Of course, they end up scoring a touchdown, completed pass to Antonio Brown with like 13 seconds left in the first half. And then all of a sudden, Kansas City goes into the locker room down by 15. You take those points off the board. If that doesn't happen, it's 14 to six at halftime. The Chiefs are down by one score. They get the ball back after halftime. They march right down the field and kick another field goal. It becomes 14 to nine. It's a five point game at that point. Now, obviously, I know that Leonard Fournette ran for a touchdown right after that on the next possession for Tampa Bay. But the Chiefs at that point, before that even happens, are looking at a deficit of five points. That didn't happen, and all of a sudden the game got way out of hand after that Leonard Fournette touchdown. So I think you have to go back to that drive, that last, that one minute left in the first half drive by Tampa Bay, and I think it's a fair question. What was the clock management decision making process like for the coaching staff there? You know, this is not the first time, guys. Again, I love Andy Reid, but it's not the first time that Andy Reid has been criticized for his clock management. It hasn't happened recently, and I think it's because you've got guys like Patrick Mahomes who make up for that sort of thing. But in this game, again, Tampa Bay exposed a lot of issues. I think it's fair to call into question some of that decision-making process. You know, the only pushback I'll have on that is, you know, just, and I'm only going to talk about that one particular timeout, because if you remember, uh, Tampa Bay actually was in the, in the hurry up offense at that point. And this is just me speculating. I, I think that all, all that timeout, all it did was give Tampa Bay an extra five seconds. I think they would have had that ball snapped within five to six seconds, you know, or that's what they, that's what they got saved by Andy Reid calling that timeout. If he didn't, it would have taken another five, six, they would have got to the line and, and called the play. But to that point in what I'm, I mean, this is pure speculation, right? Who knows? They're in the hurry up offense. Maybe that throws their timing off. Maybe that, you know, is, is something that then ultimately leads to them not being productive on that down. So I get, there's a lot of speculation with that, but they were in the hurry up. So that's kind of my, it just didn't bother me in the moment. Um, but you know, I, I certainly get the criticism there. So I want to ask you guys a question and I don't, I don't want to, to force this as a story. So if, if, you know, I'm, if I ask this question about you, just go, no, I don't, I don't think it's a factor. Then so be it. Let's let, I, I want to move on. But uh, did he, both of you, I'm sure heard the story about Britt Reed, the chiefs uh, outside linebackers coach, correct? So Britt Reed, yes, son yeah. of Andy Reed uh, Thursday night was in a car accident. Um, on uh, 435 up here in in Kansas City, and he struck two vehicles uh, that were parked on the on ramp. And one of the two little girls were in the back seat of one of the vehicles, and were one which was is in still as far as I know is still in critical care, um, and potentially was I mean it was life threatening conditions. Uh, he was asked by the police, you know just basically what what was going on said he had two two to three alcoholic beverages the police report states that they smelt a moderate amount of alcohol so there's not been any dui charged anything like that uh the vehicles were parked on the on ramp but certainly there's a lot going on there uh find out later Britt himself was actually in the hospital do you think at all that that factored in you know uh, just on Andy Reid's having had having his head in the game and and I guess before I ask you guys because I'm not trying to make this a trap or anything I I think it had to affect a little bit but just a probably a negligible amount in, in my opinion but I'm curious if you guys have a different take I mean while I was watching the game I you know I was aware of the story I never put that together until you just mentioned it. 
Um, and I'm I'm not sure that I would agree that it had an impact in my mind. I'm not saying that it didn't. I'm sure as a father it would, but you know, in my mind, you know, I I, I don't believe that it had a measurable impact on the game. I think it absolutely did. Um, yeah, and I I just say that because of just based on the what? emotional. Well, just based on just the emotional weight that I think that the whole franchise probably was carrying going into that game, you know, concern about one of their coaches, obviously concern about the little girl that is still in the hospital fighting for her life in a coma. Um, just that overall pressure, I think it clouds the atmosphere a little bit. And and not to mention the fact that we're talking about a, a different kind of Super Bowl week than we've ever seen before. Kansas City didn't even get there until 24 hours before. Before the game, um, so all the festivities were different. Nothing was really the same. Uh, the the preparation had to be a little bit different because you weren't actually preparing in Tampa Bay. Where let's keep in mind the Buccaneers got to prepare all week on their home field. I'm not saying that that was a huge impact, but that's got to mean a little bit, right? So I think just that overall. I agree. I just think that the di- the difference in the way that this weekend set up for Kansas City, especially compared to the way that last year's Super Bowl set up for them, I think it absolutely had to be a factor. And I think that that tragic event, you know, that happened on Thursday, so close to before, you know, so close to, you know, the Chiefs are preparing for the big game and they're getting ready to fly out. They're making all of their, you know, their plans and everything. I, I think it absolutely had to play a role. I'm not saying that that's why the Chiefs lost, but I think that just the overall <laughs> Men, the mental cloud, the emotional cloud, the heaviness, the pressure with all of that that was going on. I absolutely think it probably played a, a little bit of a role because let's face it, these guys are human and Andy Reid is a father. So, you know, I, I get that, you know, he's going to come out post game and say that, you know, that while he's sad about everything that happened, you know, that accident had nothing to do with what the actual outcome on the field was. I understand that's got to be his answer, but it's hard for me to not think that at least it played a little bit of a role. See, uh, for me, like I, I would actually going back in terms of the decision making, I don't actually even mind the timeouts at the end of the first half for the Chiefs to try to get the ball back. Think about how the Chiefs defense was playing at that point. They started the game. They forced two punts. Harrison Butker hits the field goal. Tom Brady comes back. They get a touchdown. The defense makes a huge goal line stand. So at that point, then the Chiefs, uh, they, they get that t- a terrible punt by Tommy Townsend that was negated. They had the great punt that was negated by a penalty. Tommy Townsend punts 29 yards. So the Chiefs are defending a short field. I think Tampa Bay took over like the 40 or the 38 or something. So they go in and score on a short field, which you know, statistically they should do when you start that close. If you're starting at the 35-yard line, 40-yard line and in, that's really tough for the defense to, to stop. So – at that point in the game, one minute left, it's a one-possession game. I feel like the Chiefs' defense is playing really good. And one of the other you know, plays that led to a Tampa Bay touchdown, th- there were several penalties that were, that were huge. And the biggest one was on that last drive. It was the offsides that kept it going that allowed Tampa Bay to go for the touchdown when – in any universe of professional football, they should kick the field goal and we should be getting the ball back. Does Kansas City have a realistic chance to score? Yes, but it's not a great chance to score. I realize that. But still, they get three and they they should never have gotten seven. But we line up off sides. Kansas City knows a little something about lining up off sides against Tom Brady, do they not? Uh, and, and so I don't think that it's a, a necessarily a bad decision at all to to try to do that because the Chiefs' defense played well in the first half, in my opinion. You know, you, but, you cannot but Blake, line Blake. up off sides. But you're facing Tom Brady. If it was if it was Jimmy Garoppolo, I would say absolutely try to get the ball back with a minute to go. But it's it's Tom Brady combined with the fact that that first half was one of, if not the worst halves of the Patrick Mahomes era. So why not just try to get the hell out of there as quickly as you can and lick your wounds and regroup and come out for the second half? I, I, that, that's not, to that's me, that not the Chiefs D- DNA. I mean, that's not what they have done the entire and season. And look yeah, what but you are the same person who criticizes when the Chiefs don't go for the throat, when they play too conservatively, and now they don't play conservatively, and you're still not happy. 
So well, you have t- you can't have it both ways. And Tommy, you're the only thing I'm going to say about your argument, though, you're kind of deflating your own argument because you're saying, you know, hey, look, but this is Tom Brady. That's kind of the point, right? Like it's not Jimmy Garoppolo. You know, those points are coming at a premium and you, you got to feel like you got to go down the field and give yourself an opportunity to go score. You know, I kind of think. Uh, that I'll give you a chance to jump in because I do. I, I you've got to let me go on a little rant about this off offside. So Tommy, I want to let you counter real quick. <laughs> I, I, I my only counter to that is that yeah, like historically, I've been upset when I feel like the Chiefs go ultra conservative, but it's within the context of the situation. You know, I'm not saying when you know the Chiefs are fourth and thirty three that they need to go for it every time. Like that's ridiculous. But in the yeah, context of that situation, to me me that was not the right time to try to get greedy and say all right we've got we've got a minute to get the ball back because let's face it the the way that the Chiefs defense were playing even in the first half on third down the the Buccaneers were extending drives so at at best you were getting the ball back with just a few seconds left anyway so you we're not, we're not talking about four or five minutes left in the half we're talking about under a minute left in the half what Tampa do you Bay think was you're only going four to be for able to do on third down they were only but four what do you, for 12 on third down but what do you think you were going to be able to do if you were going to be able to stop tom brady at that point as weston has mentioned there were no adjustments that were being made so what would lead you to believe that there would be anything different offensively in the in the waning seconds of the first half i mean well, i still got patrick being, mahomes don't i don't we still have patrick mahomes and tyree yeah, kill and, and have we seen them do that before and i will say, yeah and he's running to i'll add this too because i Look, I, I get what you're saying, Tommy, but at the same time, though, you know the mindset of Kansas City, right or wrong, is kind of what Blake's saying. Like the, the mindset is, regardless of how we have been playing, our offense is the best offense in the entire NFL. We've got a quarterback. We can start clicking sling, at any moment. Sling the ball over hey, the, the field. Bo- the I think only, that's where they go. The- the, the final thing I want to say about that is just I, I understand your argument, but at the end of the day, the results are the, the, the the results are the only thing that matters. And the Chiefs had an opportunity to go into the locker room down by eight. Instead, they went in down by 15. It was completely avoidable for them to be down 15 at halftime. That's my only point. Which, which is a perfect segue into me talking about lining up offsides. Is so one so real quick really- here, Weston, we will mention Kansas City had 11 11- Penalties, 120 yards. They set a record for penalties in the first half, um, which I didn't think that all of them were bad calls. Some of them were bad calls. But, uh, yeah, that that offensive, that offsides penalty that you're about to, to rant on, especially after the AFC game against Tom Brady, that was that was hard to watch. It's not even like it, to me. I don't. I don't even care what's happened in the history. I don't care that the Chiefs have a bad take with this. As an NFL player, honestly, at the college level, maybe even at the prep level, it is absolutely just there are no excuses for lining yourself off sides. I can understand if there's a hard count and you flinch at that, you jump at that. That's going to happen. That's reactionary. But just to position yourself. Offsides is one of the most ludicrous things as, that you can do as a football and player. And it wasn't close. It, it was me not even nuts. close. You're, you're and you're exactly right too. It's not. He was literally had a guy right next to him, and he had a full <laughs> helmet in front of the guy right next to him. It makes no sense and is just inexcusable, and it drives me insane. But you know, look, and that was uh, look that one. Of course, you know there was no questions about it. That was just an absolute stupid penalty for the Chiefs. Um, the others though, you know, I think we'll get into a lot of debate and I think it would have, there probably would have been a lot more conversation around the other penalties had this game been closer. Um, but it, it the, one of the, the S and the Sunday night football, I think it's Terry McCauley. He said that those two of the defensive holding yeah. penalties were not at the standard that were called in the NFC championship game, in his opinion. Well, and so particularly, I'm you know I'm thinking of the so the one before we line up offsides to put them into field goal position. Yes, would have got fields. So it was on Charvarius Ward. Mike Evans runs. I don't know. It was like a five six yard hitch. He stops the route, takes his right arm, puts it in Charvarius Ward's back, and Charvarius Ward. 
at that point, in my opinion, has every has every right to grab. I didn't even see him grab. But had he done it with Mike Evans literally stopping that round, turn around and shoving and something. And look, I, I get there. Sometimes you're like, look, that's a penalty, but it never gets called, you know, on the offense, blah, blah, blah. That is one that, that gets called on the offense. That's missed. And then to turn around and call that on Traverius Ward is insane. I just don't. I cannot understand what was possibly what they were thinking, how you can miss something like that in the Super Bowl of, of all places. Look, because if it's a regular AFC game, there's just refs that aren't that great. It's it's hard to do. I'm not going to say that it's not, but the Super Bowl is supposed to be the best of the best. They have to earn that privilege to, to ref in the Super Bowl, and you can't blatantly miss stuff like that. You just can't do it. Now, so then moving on to Tyron Matthews in the end zone, that one I, I – while I lean towards disagreeing with it, I can understand, you know, he kind of grabs, pushes. There's a conversation about, you know, could could Evans actually get to that ball had had he not do that? I get we'll called on the defense Evans. all the time because, right. it, you know, they're, they're fav- they want points to be scored. It, you know, right, that, right. Uh, and I would maybe advocate. Gotten those calls too. Right. I would advocate for it to not be called, but I, I understood the premise behind right. that one. But that was all set up by the horrible call that, was on Charvarius Ward just to start that possession. And look, you know, I get that the, the game the spread ended up so big that it's hard to really, I don't know, hone in on, on a, a few bad calls, but it does. It, it really affected the, the, that first half, the way the chiefs were playing, how they reacted and, and then what led to the second half. Real quick, Tommy, yeah, you I know what? what what's the question? A correction and retraction. So we did go a little Brian Williams and conflate this. The offside penalty was actually on the second to last drive. It was on McCole Hardman that took a Ryan Suckup field goal off the board. And then they scored on that pass to Rob Gronkowski at the 605 mark. And the only penalties that happened on that last drive were the two pass interference penalties on right. Rashad Breland that Tommy mentioned and Tyron Matthew that you just mentioned, Weston. Um, doesn't make the offside it, penalty any less aggravating, but I did just want to correct that before we moved on. Well, Go and, ahead, Tommy. And Blake, I, I, I want to mention two other penalties. And again, we I don't think we need to harp on the officiating the, the entire time because there were so many other factors that led into And the Chiefs know, deserve into some of these domination. penalties too. Sure, sure, absolutely. But the two that I want to look at is the first off, that long DPI on Bashad Breland on that very last drive that we've been talking about for a few minutes now. That was clearly their feet were entangled with one another. The contact was yeah. incidental. That, that was not a foul. It was not a foul. Um, you know, it, there was there was no intent to interfere. It was literally incidental contact. Their feet were tangled up with each other and a flag was called. The other one that I want to point out, and, and again, we don't need to get into a whole topic of, you know, the, the narrative that Tom Brady gets all the calls, but the the unsportsmanlike conduct on Teron Matthew with Tom Brady, Brady chases after him, gets in his face, and Tyron Matthew is the one that ends up being flagged. And, you know, th- there were, it was just kind of a microcosm of all of that, you know, just coming together for Kansas City. And I, I, I do think that where, you know, again, that like you, like you just said, the spread was so big that it can't be pointed just back to the officiating, but it makes the Chiefs frustrated. It makes them downtrodden. You know, it makes them probably overplay a little bit. It probably makes them adjust in, in ways that they normally wouldn't do so. So I do think it does have at least some emotional effect, a especially defensively. So wrapping up here on the Chiefs, obviously uh, still a tremendous season for Kansas City. They have so much back. Andy Reid, Mahomes, Hill, Kelsey. Kelsey is the only major player for Kansas City that's over the age of 30, and he's only 31. You've got Eric Bieniemy coming back to call the plays and be the offensive coordinator. Clyde edwards helaire has recovered very well from the injury. I'm so excited to see what he's going to do. May have the doctor back on the offensive line. Going to have Williams back in the backfield, I would imagine, after he opted out. The free agent situation, you've got Sammy Watkins and Bashad Breland. Daniel Sorensen are kind of the top free agents for Kansas City. So, you know, I, I am I am holding Kansas City stock I love my team. I love this team. And I, and I think that Kansas City moving forward to next year is going to be one of the favorites in the AFC, is absolutely the favorite in the AFC West. And I know that you know teams that lose in the Super Bowl typically don't do very well the next year. 
I still think that this Chiefs team is set up for long-term success. Credit to Brett Veach and the Hunts for doing that, and I think that this team is going to be back next year. Not necessarily you know, Blake, the Super I think Bowl, that we could do. You know, I think that we could do an entire episode on what the offseason is going to look like for Kansas City and the decisions that they could possibly make. And, and we don't have a ton of time to get into that, I know, on this episode. But I will say that while I agree with everything that you're talking about, I think that Super Bowl loss, as we have, have mentioned multiple times, has exposed some things with the Chiefs that they're going to need to address in the offseason, specifically line play. And, and Weston, I go back to what you've said all the time about Brett Veach about how you know his strategy has been you know keep that keep the core guys around and spend a lot of money on them and then kind of mix and match the role players that didn't work for Kansas City in the Super Bowl especially on the offensive line you know we all know how great Brett Veach has been in the draft at least identifying talent in Patrick Mahomes and you know he's also drafted guys like Legereus Sneed and Clyde Edwards Hilaire but th- there has not been a, a, a an offensive lineman that has been drafted in the first or second round by Brett Veach since he's taken over as general manager back in 2017. I think you have to look, and I know it's way too early for us to have an in-depth conversation about the draft, but I think you have to start to address some of those needs. In my opinion, this is going to be a pivotal offseason for Brett Veach and what he does with these role players moving forward into next season, because what happened in the Super Bowl, you know, you have to understand that there are 30 other teams that were watching the Super Bowl on Sunday night, they now know the kryptonite to Superman. They now know what they need to do to beat the Chiefs. And so if you're Brett Veach, you've got to figure out a way to shore up that line play especially. And I think you need to make some decisions on, you know, in the wide receiver room, what's going to be happening after Tyreek Hill. Sammy Watkins was a bust in his return to Kansas City. I don't see a way that he's back. I wouldn't advocate for him to be back. You know, I think that there are some questions marks there. I think there are some question marks in the secondary as well, and I desperately think the Chiefs need some help opposite Frank Clark on the defensive end because really, other than him, there really has been nobody else to be able to consistently rush the quarterback. So, there are definitely some decisions that need to be made in the offseason, and like I said, I think it's going to be a pivotal one for Brett Veach. Yeah, you know, and I, I, the one thing I'll add to that, Tommy, because I don't I don't disagree with really much of what you said, Um but I don't necessarily think that Brett Beach needs to change his approach with 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 what he has done with the offensive line. I think he's done a fantastic job finding value in the offensive line. But essentially, you looked at you looked at a game where you had five offensive linemen injured, and then and then from there of what you had left, two of them were forced to play in a position that they weren't playing. So I mean, I just you know, no matter what your draft strategy is, no matter what your free agency strategy is that's just flat out tough to overcome um but with that being said i i I certainly anticipate just what you said i think there will be a first or second round look at an offensive lineman to help sure things up maybe find somebody to anchor um you know aside eric fisher and and mitchell swords and as you kind of look at those contracts kind of figure things out um you know and then on the flip side you're certainly talking about um you know what's going to happen with uh, Frank Clark's money, not so much Frank Clark, but you know, is there a way that they can kind of work something out with him to be able to free up some of that cap hit that he has? Uh, I don't know if you if you guys saw a lot of the the speculation, and, and maybe it's even been announced now, but the cap's actually shrinking next year. Um, and there was some conversation. I don't know who had it, so I, I feel bad because I can't credit them. But somebody had had a conversation with Brett Veach, and he said if the number was at one hundred at one hundred eighty million, he felt they would be fine. I think it's been either announced or speculated that the number is going to come in at one hundred eighty one million. So um, shouldn't have to be any any too big of cap casualties there. More just like you mentioned, Tommy. What can we do with the money? How can we adjust it to, to better fit a few of the areas that we need? Um, so I'm excited for the off season. I mean, as, as Blake mentioned, I mean, this team's going to be the, the favorite in the AFC West for the next 10 years. They're going to be one of the favorites in the AFC for the next 10 years. And, you know, we, we talk about our, our love for Patrick Mahomes all the time on this podcast, but truly that's what the NFL is. I mean, it is finding that quarterback. It is having one of the top five quarterbacks or you're just flat out not going to be able to compete with the rest of the league, you know, with, with a few rare exceptions. So um, Kansas City is going to be in a good position. They're going to be in a good position moving forward. And I, I mean, I'm excited to see it's like Tommy, I saw you had a post 
Um, I think I can't remember if it was on Twitter or Facebook or maybe both, but you know, up, we spent basically 30 years of our lives, not even knowing what it was like to be in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and now we've experienced both the, the feeling of, of winning the Super Bowl and losing the Super Bowl. And, and boy, I like winning the Super Bowl a whole lot better than that feeling of losing. It. I like being in the Super Bowl. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it also, it also Agreed. comes with a good position of, of the hope that we have. Right. And it's something that I had talked about. And that Tommy, I don't know if we talked about it very early on in, in, in our podcast, um, I, I don't think so because it was maybe it was just conversation I had with my friends pro, uh, post the first playoff loss for Pat. I think it was the Patriots in well right before the Super Bowl run, and things just felt different. Like I just didn't take that yeah. one that loss as hard because I, I think we realized what we had in Patrick Mahomes, and it just felt like those opportunities were going to be there. And you don't want to take anything for granted, right? Because you never know how things are going to play out. But this still just kind of feels different. Just like you mentioned, Blake, like, like you were alluding to Tommy. I mean, this, the future just feels so different. There's so much more internal optimism to be a fan of this franchise that it, it, it doesn't probably sting as it might've, you know, stung two years ago or three years ago. Um, so I'm excited. The only other thing, Blake, we got to make, I'm going to make a correction on your correction because the official stat was that McCole Hardman lined up off sides, but it absolutely was not McCole Hardman. I'm almost 99% sure it was Antonio Hamilton. So I'm not going to let my boy McCole be slandered, but they did know. That's, that's, that's fine. They, that's- and they absolutely. Yeah, they absolutely called it on McColl, but if you watch that replay, it was the complete other side of the line. I think they just missed up the number. I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain it was Antonio Hamilton. Okay, yeah, and I, I, I won't. The, 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 the stats for forever, <laughs> forever, it will be on on You're McCole right. Hardman. You're right. Anyway, hey, so can I can I just mention? What, one more quick thing before we move yeah. on, because I know we're going to get away from football, and I feel like it's a it's a good time just to just to mention. Of course, everybody knows Marty Schottenheimer passed away, um, age of seventy seven, uh, due to Alzheimer's. We mentioned him on the last episode that he was moved to hospice care. Um, so a, a, a rough forty eight hours or so for Chiefs Kingdom. Hey, and Tommy, I don't know. I don't know if you guys saw this. I, I think this would be a good time to mention this too. Uh, so, Therese Paler of Yahoo Sports and Kansas City yeah. Beats, he he passed away today as well. Thirty seven. Wow, unexpectedly. Yeah, thirty seven. Yeah, I, I just yeah, I saw that about half That's an hour shocking. before the podcast. So, a long time writer for the Kansas City Star, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, he yeah, absolutely that, wow, was. He was he was so good. Interacted with so many folks on Twitter. You know, folks that weren't necessarily you know not a blue check mark or anything. Just interacted with with Chiefs Kingdom and was pretty much loved by everyone and i saw a pretty interesting or or good take tweet from somebody so marty schottenheimer passed away 21 years to the day that Derek thomas passed away so they said (laughs) that uh therese must have been called up to heaven to cover those two uh at the same time so i thought that was a pretty neat a neat tweet but anyways the rest of these both therese and and marty Football fans, uh, it's going to be a long, cold off season, so better strap in. Football is over, and obviously just about uh, Labor Day, Chiefs will be getting it going in the 2021-2022 NFL season. On to college basketball, the Kansas Jayhawks dropping out of the top 25 for the first time in 12 years, 231 weeks. You've got Duke, UNC, KU, and UK out of the AP men's poll for the first time since 1961, the Jayhawks lose 91-79 at number 17 West Virginia on Saturday. But the Jayhawks bounced back a statement win yesterday at home, 78-66 over the Oklahoma State Cowboys, number 23 team in the country. Five Jayhawks in double figures, three Jayhawks at a double-double. Um The depth of KU was very concerning because the bench players in this game were terrible. They were awful for Kansas, but the starting five played great. We'll get to McCormick, who had a monster day, but the defense was so much better. They hold Oklahoma State to 23 of 56 from the field. I beg your pardon, 22 of 63 from the field, 35%. Oklahoma State shoots less than 30% from the three-point line. They were so much better defensively in the half court in this game. Uh, The fast break points, they only gave up eight fast break points. We've talked, I'm sure you guys have talked a lot about how this Kansas team is just not as good in transitional offense as a lot of Bill Self's teams were. Certainly not even close to the Roy Williams KU teams at all, but it's a different style of offense, obviously, but defensively, 
Kansas played so much better against the Cowboys on Monday, and that is a top 25 team. I know that they are not ranked in the top 25 team. That team that showed up on Monday is a top 25 team, and I think that they'll be back in the top 25, obviously, with Iowa State coming up. But it was for me, it was so good to see Kansas actually put together a whole game, not that there weren't stretches, where Cade Cunningham was able to find a shot. He still scored 26, but... They played good team defense. They forced tough shots. They crushed Oklahoma State on the glass. Uh, they outread it, bounded it by three on the offensive glass. Great defensive performance by Kansas. That is what they're going to need more of, along with the improved post play, I think, to continue getting back to what we expect Kansas basketball to be. You know, 23 and 10 out of David McCormick. And I think I definitely wanted to lead with that because we have been pretty quick on this podcast to criticize David McCormick. And, and, and not, probably, not this guy. And probably not this guy. Right, rightfully so, though. I mean, he's played pretty poor, you know, throughout the year. What Whether it's because of what defense is threw at him, this or that, he's played a lot better as of late. He's really found his game. Um, you know, I do, I still think the Jayhawks need to kind of figure out what they want this offense to be. Um, if they can continue to play defense like they played against Oklahoma State, that provides them the opportunity to work the ball through the post and work the ball through David McCormick. Um, but when they play poor defense like we've seen in the past, you can't trade threes for twos. It just doesn't work even when David McCormick is is clicking. So it's kind of one of the – it's almost kind of like the Kansas City conversation we had about the Chiefs and the offense, multiple things just leading the whole thing to spiral out of control. For Kansas, the Kansas Jayhawks – you know, when they play great defense, that allows them to come down, play, run their set offense, take the time to work the ball through David McCormick and allow him to dominate or do the things that, that he can do at times. Um, but as soon as they stop playing that defense or they have a team that just gets hot, hot shooting, it kind of makes everything sporadic and, and spiral out of control, right? And that, that starts with either how quickly they're trying to force the ball to McCormick, him getting sporadic with the ball when he's got it, or just – flat out not you know us not shooting the three and then we're just trading threes for twos which gets you, you far behind in the the way the game of basketball is played these days so it was it was really refreshing to see a good defense and, and frankly against an Oklahoma State team that I I realized they're probably going to be unranked after this week be, being they were 23 23rd uh, coming into the game and another loss probably bumps them out. It's kind of hard to be at the back end of the AP top 25 and, and stay in after a loss. But I, I think this is a very good Cowboys basketball team. So it's not like, you know, we're trying to parade around about what KU did after, you know, beating Iowa State or something. But um, very encouraged to, to see what, what we saw out of this team. And uh, I'm also curious, and, and Tommy, you may have some some thoughts ready, but I'm curious too if you guys think we will see – much of, of all of Dewan Harris anymore. I mean, he played very little in this game, um, you know, and I think he has limitations defensively just being a smaller, not quite as athletically gifted guy as some of the, some of the others on this roster. And now that it's kind of clicked, do you think we kind of see this rotation, this group, this, this spread on the minutes, kind of how things are going to move forward with this team? Yeah, so Weston, I I don't think that we're gonna see as much Dewan Harris um, because he does have limitations. He's not a shooter, um, you know. He he's got kind of you know a little bit of a size limitation. I think he's good handling the basketball, but really aside from that, th- there's really not a whole lot of upside right now with him. I think he's young. I think he'll grow into it. But I'll be honest with you, I don't particularly care about Dewan Harris right now. The only thing that I care about. The only thing that I care about is getting an apology from Blake Cripps, a much needed apology from Blake Cripps. And and, and I'll tell you why. (laughs) Two weeks ago on the two weeks ago on this program, I talked about how we needed to start thinking about Kansas dropping out of the top 25. Blake looked at me like I was from a different country, like I was ridiculous, like I was an idiot. Yet here we are two weeks later. And the University of Kansas Jayhawks are out of the top 25 poll for the first time since 2009. So I will all sit back and I'll listen as Blake. Uh, I know that you probably written out a long, eloquent apology to me. I'm looking forward to hearing it right now. Yeah, I did. It's right here. And so uh, what's, what's that? I regret nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that's done. No, 
There was no reason to worry about the Jay, Jayhawks falling out of the top 25. If they had won these games, they wouldn't have been out of the top 25. And now that they are out of the top 25, it doesn't matter at all. What would I apologize for exactly? For telling me that that it was not anything that we even needed to talk about. It's, it's a big it deal. Wasn't. It still isn't. It's not a big deal. Why, why is it a big deal? They're still going to qualify for the tournament. They're still in complete control of their own destiny. If they win out, they might be in the top 10 at the end of the year. So what does it matter? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think- guess that maybe having an NCAA record actually matters a little bit. You know, like maybe winning they a consecutive number of Big 12 – I know they do, but wouldn't you want to continue that record? Well, of course, but that's, you know, these things don't go on forever. And if it was going to have a season that it was going to end, it's probably going to be this crazy season where the Jayhawks have no advantage in Allen Fieldhouse. It was probably going to happen this year. I mean, let's, let's take one second here to look at the guys off last year's team that aren't here. Okay. I mean, last year's team, I don't know what you guys thought about it because you guys were on the show and I was not at that point. I think last year's team would have won the national championship. That's my opinion. There were a ton of playmakers on that team, and most of them are not here anymore. So you can't, you're not going to just plug guys in to replace those every single year. There is a dip. It, it, it just happens. And at home, the Jayhawks have not had that security blanket of 16,300 in Allen Fieldhouse. The Jayhawks had lost five of seven going into the Oklahoma State game. All five were on the road. All five of them were on the road to teams that are in the top 25 of the net rankings. So, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not panicking. I'm still not panicking. I'm, I'm holding the Chiefs, and I'm holding Jayhawk stock. Long term, this is a team, especially if they play like they did against Oklahoma State, this is a team that could be really, really dangerous in March. I mean, he looks like he's going to say something, but I'm not sure. Tommy, do we have? Oh, there we go. Are you, talking to, are, are you talking to me? Okay. Hey, your video, your yeah, video no. had frozen with you, with you, with a pen, and you were right here, and we we're like, <laughs> he's about to do, but I don't know if he's doing it or not. No, I am, and I just want to say that you know, I know that you're holding Jayhawk stock, and and I, I'm holding Jayhawk stock too. Well, I probably not like holding, it. I'm probably not holding as much as you are. I'm probably not all in on the Jayhawks at this point. I'm holding a little bit of stock, but I think we all have to admit there are still major problems with this squad. There's not a, in my opinion, there's not a worse team when it comes to starting games off than the University of Kansas Jayhawks. I mean, if you go back and look at their last like seven or eight games, they, they're they down 7, 9, 11, 12, 14 points in the first half out of the gate. This, this team has significant issues getting started. And, and that was the case against Oklahoma State as well. They were down by quite a few early on in the game. Of course, they came back and, and they won the game. I know that defensively, they kind of turned it on against the Cowboys. Uh, I guarantee you that was because they gave up 91 points to the Mountaineers over the weekend and Bill Self was not about to let that happen again. So that was good to see. I mean, I do think, think that there are some good things to look at. I think the fact that they scored 50 points in the second half against Oklahoma State the first time that KU has scored 50 points and a half against a Big 12 team since last Last year, last season, that was the last time they put up 50 and a half against a Big 12 opponent. So yeah, there are some good things for sure, but I think that there are still some major issues. I think that there are issues with the bench, like you talked about. Again, there are issues with the way that they start games. So until they get those things shored up, I know it's a little bit of an easier stretch over the next two weeks for KU, but the last three games of the Big 12 season and then going into the Big 12 tournament and then, of course, the the big dance, they've got some issues they need to work out sooner rather than later if they want a chance to at least you know do well and go at least a decent distance in the NCAA tournament. You know, Tommy, I've always thought that it, you know, as we've heard Blake rant about Kansas football, I always thought, man, you know, it's just not fair that Blake has the same expectations for Kansas football as he does for Kansas basketball. And now I'm don't. thinking, and now I'm thinking, wow, Blake has the same expectations for Kansas basketball as he does for Kansas football. He sets the bar so low. I just don't understand. <laughs> what? 
Like, I, are, is okay. this a real take that's happening here? But, you think I have the same expectations for Kansas football as Kansas basketball? Well, you're like, oh, not in the top 25. No big deal. But here, let me t- hold on. Let me tell you why it actually is a big deal. Because so going into the, the Oklahoma State game, and, I, you know, I thought it was kind of funny that you said, you know, well, if they if they won those games, they were going to be in the top 25. Well, that's the whole point is that they weren't winning games and they continued to not win games, which put them out of the top 25. But anywho, the, the point about not being in the top 25, Joe Lenardi currently has Kansas as a six seed. So going and so prior to Oklahoma State, let's say they don't win that game against number 23, Oklahoma State. They've got two against Iowa State, one against Kansas State. Then they've got Baylor. Um, they've got Baylor, Texas and Texas Tech. Is that right? The Texas Tech's the one I'm not sure about. Yeah. So let's say they go three and four after not being ranked. I think there's a real opportunity that they miss the tournament at that point. No, the, come on. If they go three and four to finish out the season in an early exit in the Big 12 tournament, and they're currently sitting zero at zero chance. No. I mean, I think that's a legitimate possibility. And then that well, becomes I mean, it's, the, it's the not, big deal, right? I mean, it's a, it's a moot point because they, they won the game. But I mean, even, no, I, I wouldn't think so. No. But I mean, there's still, but I mean, you have to acknowledge to some degree that they are in a, in a, in a territory that we've never seen them in before. Um, you know, we saw again, them in the Roy Williams era in, the, in this territory. They were an eight seed in Roy Williams. We've seen well, this before. Hey, what? Just what because, did, just because you're older, just because you're older than us and you remember those days doesn't oh, mean that oh, we you have don't to remember. Them. You don't remember those no. days. Really, I Tommy. Think, oh, I think, come on. I think Roy <laughs> Williams left when I was like 12 or 11 years old, and I'm not even kidding about this, guys. <laughs> yeah, um, I was a, I was in high school when he left. So what are you – like, I, old? What are you talking that's about? That's forever ago. But, oh, you know, well. here, here – so – and I guess my question is too – and Ern, it's not a question, but I'm going to I'm gonna go back to, to writing the fins like I did before though because – well, that, that, That's real brave. But I just feel like that's where we're at with this team because we, you know, there's certainly there's some aspects of this that you have to be concerned about as as a Kansas fan. I mean, they're gonna they're very well gonna finish in potentially gonna finish in the bottom half of the Big Twelve. We've not seen that in how how many how long. They're you know you get into the Big Twelve tournament. I certainly don't think anybody's expecting that they're gonna win that. Then you get to an in, and then potentially whether they get. I mean, if you have to acknowledge that there is a path in which they could not be in the tournament. I I'm not saying I'm expecting that to happen, but there is a path in which that happens, you know, and, and, but at the same time, just like we all acknowledge, they played great against Oklahoma state. This is still a bill self coach team and that there is talent, um, all across this roster. It's a a matter of making things click. So I'm with you. Tommy on the fact that there are certainly some concerns of what's going on with this team, not some sort of overarching. And I've the ESPN, that ESPN plus broadcast multiple times mentioned the investigation, what kind of effect that's having on, on the recruiting and, and whether it's a cloud hanging over the, the, the university and the athletic program. I think that's pretty minuscule at this point. Obviously it could blow everything up in six months time. But I think that, I don't know. I just think that's pretty minuscule, but on the flip side, you know, I think there certainly is a lot of talent on this roster. And anytime, anytime you got bill self coaching a team, leading a team, I feel excited about, you know, what they could do if they got into a tournament. I mean, I think they've got plenty of shooters to get hot. They've got a big man. They've got a defensive stopper and Marcus Garrett. They do have some of those ingredients. So I, I'm going to continue to ride the fence because I really do see this could just being able to go in either direction from this given point. That's weak. I think that we, well, I think that we can, Blake, you and I can agree upon the fact that it's it's kind of, I mean, like you said, weak for, for Weston to, to ride the fence like that. That's I want to give a lame. shout out. I want to give a shout out to uh, an avid CogPod listener, our friend Tyler Litton, who accurately called out Weston on Twitter about him <laughs> riding the fence I don't know if I over that. and over and over again. Um, Cause I think that's absolutely true. I actually want to give, uh, I want to actually end my part on KU on a positive note. And I know that it's going to sound wow. negative at the beginning um, because I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% out on this team. I just said, I'm holding a little bit of, of Kansas stock. I'm just not all in like I probably was at the beginning of the season. 
so it's going to sound negative, but I promise you it's positive. And I want to end my part of this on a positive note. And that is, if you look at the game on Big Monday against Oklahoma State, obviously, Blake, you mentioned it about how terrible and abysmal the bench play was for the Jayhawks. There were two bench it points in bad. that game. Two bench points. Tristan and Aruna had one point. Mitch Lightfoot had one point. Those were the only bench points in the entire game. But here's the positive note. According to our friend Gary Bedore from the Kansas City Star, uh, he tweeted today that Bill Self said that Bryce Thompson practiced in full today. That would be on Tuesday. And he might be able to play versus Iowa State on Thursday. That's less than four weeks after he had surgery on his broken finger. Now, I'm not saying that Bryce Thompson is the end-all be-all, but he had kind of moved himself into that sixth man role off the bench for Kansas before he got injured. There's clearly an issue with depth on the bench for the Jayhawks. So getting Bryce Thompson back, especially in a stretch of games, Iowa State twice, Kansas State after that, where you can sort of get your feet underneath you before you get into the grueling last three games of the Big 12 season and then into the tournament and beyond, I think is huge. So if that can happen, I, I am positive about that. Hopefully that can happen for Kansas. See, I think that this, as we wrap this up, I think that that's the difference between you and I, Tommy. I'm all in on Kansas football. I'm holding the stock. I just know that it's garbage, but I'm still all in. I've never gotten out of being all in on Kansas football. So that's the difference between you and me. I totally agree. Depth Come is on. the biggest issue for Come KU on. basketball. But Weston, going back to something that you had said about David McCormick not being very good, over his last seven games, David McCormick is averaging, what is that? Oh, yeah, 18 points per game. Hey, Can I interest you in that with two exactly double doubles? What I do you said, want out of him? That's what I said. He's been playing well of late. He played like hot garbage, like your KU football team in the beginning of the season. was it hot garbage? He had, he had a couple of really great games early in the season. He hasn't had the consistency that everybody would like. I will grant you that. But I, I think David McCormick, people need to lay off of him a little bit. He was a Without David McCormick, KU gets blowed out by Oklahoma State in that game on Monday, my opinion. Moving on to Wichita State, the Shockers had to kind of gut out a win as they beat the Temple Owls 70-67 to on Sunday at Charles Koch Arena. They are next in action this week as you're getting this podcast. They are going to play 6 p.m. on Wednesday at Central Florida, a team that they just survived the Knights by five at Charles Cook Arena on January the 30th in an overtime Tommy, win. Central now? Florida is in the bottom half of the American Athletic Conference standings, and this was a game that – Wichita State had to rely on the three-point line. They shot the ball really well from the three, 43%, 9 for 21. Temple was just 3 of 19 from the line. And uh, Tyson Etienne was, again, fantastic for Wichita State with 20 points to lead four shockers and double figures. Trey Wade, Morris Udeze, and Dexter Dennis also there for Wichita State in this game. They played good defense. Uh, I, another tight game, but you know this. Which and I, I was listening to Mike Kennedy on the call, Tommy, and he said, you know, if you've got blood pressure problems. This is not going to be your favorite Wichita State team because they just don't quite have that killer instinct yet. And I think that, that could be a problem in the American tournament if this team makes a run to March. Uh, they, they don't play well down the stretch in games, but they just seem to find enough plays down the stretch to win ball games. Uh, the defense was not nearly as good for Wichita State in the second half as they allowed Temple to score 41 points. They led 28-26 at the half. But on the flip side of it, they don't seem to get rattled offensively. They, they've given. They always seem to give themselves a chance to win. And so, you know, if if I'm Coach Brown at this point, and he kind of said this in post game, didn't execute the way that they wanted to down the stretch, particularly defensively, but they did make enough plays to secure the win, um, and they're on a three game winning streak. Yeah, they are. And, you know, I, I want to give a tip of the cap to Dexter Dennis. I mean, he's a guy that consistently puts in, you know, the dirty work and the hard work. 
game in and game out. He had 10 points against Temple, but really it hasn't been his offense in, in you know this season much. It's been what he's done defensively, and that's why he continues to earn the trust of Isaac Brown game in and game out to play a considerable amount of minutes. And I want to go back to the two-lane game. I know that we discussed that a little bit on last week's episode, but I didn't realize that the, the leading scorer for two-lane, Jalen Forbes, he was averaging 15 and a half points a game. Uh, he entered the game on a hot streak and he came off a career best 23 point performance and it scored double digits in eight straight games. He was held without a field goal. Dexter Dennis was his primary defender. He shot zero for 13 from the field against Wichita State due in large part to Dexter Dennis and his hard work defensively. And he's done that multiple times this season, you know, against guys like Xavier Pinson from Missouri, Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State, Quentin Grimes from Houston. He's consistently being put on the leading scorer from these other teams. And he's been a big factor as to why Wichita State is now on this winning streak and why they were able to defend at home so well and have that three game winning streak at home. You know, I, as we watch this team, you know, get better and better. And, and boy, I mean, you can just see the talent with this team. I think I think it's setting up to make it even more and more disappointing when and if they don't make the tournament, because this team is a very talented team. This is a team that go would go into a tournament, I think, and really surprise some teams or, or have has that DNA to, to really make make some some waves in the tournament. And it's just I just even more gut wrenching, I guess, that the schedule really, you know, developed the way that it did, and, and it's going to be unfortunate that they just don't have the resume to put together, um, you know, that they can. But uh, they're playing incredible basketball right now, and you again have to just be. I, I, I mean, maybe as an outside looking in, someone who I, you know, hand up, I'm not a Wichita State Shocker fan first. So, I mean, my my viewing goes, you know, with the Kansas Jayhawks first, Wichita State second. So, But outside looking in, I have just been so impressed with what I've seen out of Isaac Brown and what he's got out of such a tough, tough, um, you know, scenario position to be put in going into a season. Him being kind of a last second appointment, no off season, you know, uh, all sorts of turnover on the roster. And my goodness, this team is, is really starting to click and play some good basketball. And, and like you mentioned, like, I mean, you know, they they grind these wins out, right? I mean, you're not you're not seeing blowout wins. You're seeing, you know, just a I mean, a, a good grind it out. I mean, and, and you know what? And as I'm saying, this is kind of clicking too. I, I feel like this team, the the personality of the team kind of embodies the personality of Dexter Dennis a little bit too, right? Like they're they're willing to to go in and grind that out. They're willing to to do things you don't want to do to have to win basketball games, and it's not always pretty, but gets the job done and and uh, boy I think it's going to be just really disappointing if and when they they don't make the tournament well and the the other thing too that you have to think about going back to Dexter Dennis Tommy is the fact that he played only 19 minutes in the game with 10 points. He was in foul trouble the entire day, as was Udeze, and he still managed to get 11 points and seven rebounds on the interior. I, I like what Wichita is doing with the starting five. I think depth-wise, I think they don't have quite as pronounced of problems as KU does, but I do think that Clarence Jackson is not quite as consistent off the bench as he would like to be. Ricky Council is still trying to find his way. He was just two for nine from the field. And and Craig Porter Jr., two points, two rebounds in 11 minutes. It would be great to get a little bit more out of those guys. But I do feel like Coach Brown at this point kind of knows what he's getting when he gets guys off the bench. He knows what their role is. He knows what they're going to probably do. And, and he kind of has a range of what he can expect out of them. Whereas I feel like, and, and not saying that Bill Self is a worse coach or a bad coach or anything like that, but I feel like some of those bench players for Kansas, he just has no idea what he's going to get. I feel like Wichita State kind of has their rotation set at this point. They've got the starting five. They've got the next three off of the bench. And defensively, you know, Damian Dunn for Temple is a heck of a player. He was just five of 14 from the field to get his 22 points. He did shoot 12 of the team's 17 free throws, and he went 12 for 12 from the line. A couple of those calls seemed to be a little suspect. Uh, there were there was one really late that co- that uh, Mike Kennedy and Dave Dahl on, on the radio just absolutely 
hated and seeing it, it looked like a total bailout call to me at least. So, you know, that's what he does. He's one of the top free throw shooters in terms of volume in the American conference. So I I think to hold a player like Dunn to shooting just over 33% from the field, a really good showing by the Wichita State defense. And obviously against Central Florida, they're going to want more of that. A team that kind of surprised them a little bit. If they're going to make a run to the tournament, they're going to need to win. I think that they have to win the Central Florida game, the SMU game, and the Memphis game. That would give them a six-game winning streak going into a pretty tough week. But luckily, all the games are going to be at home. You've got ECU on Sunday, Houston on Thursday the 25th, SMU Sunday the 28th before finally wrapping up the season with the road trip to Tulane and Temple in that first week of March. I'm not saying that it's a guarantee that they would get in, but if they can run the table and beat Houston and maybe not go out in the first round of the American Conference Tournament, I I think that there's a window for them to get into March. It's not necessarily a big window because of that loss to Memphis and the loss to Houston that would have been really big resume-boosting wins. But I, I still I haven't given up hope that this team will be playing basketball into March. And I think if they don't make the NCAA tournament, do we is the NIT still happening this year with coronavirus? I don't even know the answer to that, know. to be honest. I have not heard either. I'm not sure. But going back to going back to your point, Blake, about you know the, the rotation of Wichita State, uh, you know, Clarence Jackson had some really good minutes for Wichita State in that overtime game. He's yeah, excited yeah, he to watch. Uh, You know, Ricky Council, the fourth, when he gets going, he's exciting to watch, too. So, you know, I know that they're still trying to find the consistency a little bit, find their footing a little bit, but they're exciting players uh, for this Shocker team. And, and, you know, we think back to that game against Memphis on the road, that 20 point defeat where I think all the Shocker Nation a little, you know, they were a little bit taken aback, like, whoa, that's kind of a punch in the mouth that we weren't really anticipating. Since that time, I've been really (laughs) impressed with how Isaac Brown has rallied the troops you know, sort of turn things around. And I agree with you. I do think that there is a window here. Keep in mind, you guys, that the Shockers are second place right now in the American Conference. They have the same number of conference losses as does Houston. Now, obviously, Houston has played more conference games. The Shockers have dealt with COVID shutdowns a couple of different times. But both the Cougars and the Shockers have two conference losses apiece. So this conference race is not over by any stretch of the imagination. I know that Houston is ranked and I know that a regular season conference championship only means so much. And when you're looking at, you know, a a bid into the NCAA tournament, you're really looking at a a tournament victory, but you could really very easily envision a scenario where the shockers enter the tournament, maybe even the number one seed, if they can continue and that huge matchup at home in the roundhouse against Houston, if they continue playing the way that they're playing, they could conceivably take over Houston for number one in the American conference. Yeah. And, and there's, I think I've been probably the most maybe outspoken about saying, you know, I just don't see the, 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 the realistic path for Wichita state. Cause I think you're right, Blake. I mean, I think running the table, absolutely. You'd have to say, Hey, look, the, Wichita state's at least got to be in the conversation of getting in the tournament with that. Right. But even aside from that, I absolutely acknowledge and, and believe full, full heartedly that, this Wichita State Shockers basketball team has the talent to, to win the American American Conference Tournament, no doubt about it. And and obviously, as we know, you win and you're in there. So, I mean, th- there's not – that it is absolutely, I, I think, what's – the most encouraging thing about the way this team's playing is it's not necessarily, you know, it's not going to be all for naught. And, and obviously there's a conversation to be had right about building momentum into the next season. And, you know, they got guys returning and those kind of things, but look, they're playing really good basketball. And even if they come up short in, in as far as winning the American regular season, that's still, like you said, Tommy puts them in a good position to, for the tournament where you, Hey, you know, you go and win one game against Houston and you're in type of deal. I mean, and I know you'd have to win multiple games, but realistically, this conference is unfolding, you know, the way that it is. It's kind of Houston, tier one, Wichita State, tier two, and then everybody else in tier three is kind of the way I look at this at this conference. So um, I, I think you got to be, you know, still fairly excited. And, and, and certainly most Wichita State fans, I would hope that you still have some optimism for sure. 
So next week when we're talking, we'll be discussing the UCF game, which is happening as this podcast is being dropped on Wednesday at Central Florida, 6 p.m. tip, and then at Moody Coliseum in Dallas, 3 p.m. against Southern Methodist. Kansas State, I was planning to just come in here and tell you, hey, by the way, Kansas State stinks. Don't worry about them. They've lost a billion in a row. Um, That game was going on as we were uh, discussing this podcast tonight, fellas. They went uh, against Texas tonight and lost by three, 80 to 77. And a big story that we're going to talk about next time on the show, just because we're running out of time, is the fact that the Kansas State Athletic Director Gene Taylor has come out and strongly endorsed Bruce Weber as the long-term solution at head coach of men's basketball at Kansas State University. Uh, Mike McGurl and Nigel Pack for Kansas State each scored 10 points in the first half. They had a three-pointer at the buzzer from half court to try to tie the game as Kansas State trailed by four at the half. Uh, Pack ended up with 22 for the Wildcats. McGurl had 18 as Texas number 13 team of the country moved to six and four in the Big 12. Kansas State has lost 11 in a row now, but um, just real quickly on Kansas State here, guys, this was obviously not not what I was expecting to happen. Full disclosure, 100% wrong. I thought Kansas State would get shellacked in this game. Uh, Just initial thoughts on Kansas State with a rally that just fell short against the Longhorns. Well, look, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I, and I know we're going to get more into it next week. And I've been very, very vocal about Bruce Weber not being the long term solution for the Kansas State Wildcats. And again, we can get into that next week. But I can see probably the reason why Gene Taylor is so bullish on Bruce Weber. And that's one guy. That's because of Nigel Pack. And that's because of the future that he he has in Manhattan. He scored 22 points in the loss against Texas on Tuesday night. Again, a close loss by only three points. And you know what? That's the exact kind of performance that Bruce Weber needed at this stage of the season. They didn't get a win, but I even said it a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about him. Yeah, it's about the results. It's about the wins and losses. But Are your teams even being competitive? Are they even showing up to the arena to play the game? And there have been multiple games this season for Kansas State where the answer is no. That was not the case inside of Bramlage tonight. Bruce Weber was able to rally his team and his team were able to go and play for him and very nearly upset Shaka Smart and the Texas Longhorns. So again, we'll get more into it next week. But um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't change things necessarily in my mind, but it does show that maybe these Wildcats are not going to completely go down without a fight. You know, and, and it, we, like you, like we've all said here now, you know, we're going to certainly dive into this deeper, and it's probably certainly an off-season t- topic that we will get into. But, you know, one thing I've always advocated for, even as we, I have probably voiced my opinion, uh, it's kind of shifting away from Bruce Weber, is I always adv- advocate for stability at the head coach position. I think that just truly does help programs to be able to give longer leashes. I think I often think it's a mistake to pull the plug on coaches too soon um, be, because, I mean, it just creates a, the circus with recruiting. And like you said, he's brought in some guys. If you're seeing some guys in this class that you're excited about, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know what – what they have in store coming up next year's in, in next year's freshman class. But if you see some things you like out of that, I mean, that alone can be worth it because ultimately what players you have in the program is going to trump necessarily what that coach is, um, you know, or at least the X's and O's of that coach that you have, you know, in the system. So uh, the good encouraging note for Kansas state, even, even in a loss, I suppose. So the, once again, uh, it's going to be a big topic of discussion on next week's show. Gene Taylor going all in on Bruce Weber as his head coach. So Kansas State fans, we will have that for you next week on the show. Our final topic today before we get to our Wichita whip around uh, has to do with high school sports right here in Wichita. The Wichita North Redskins will no longer be called that name starting next year. The vote from the Wichita Public Schools Board of Education was unanimous to accept a committee's recommendations to discontinue the Redskin mascot for Wichita North High School. It's a two-year, 
phase-in plan. It will start next school year, 2021-2022, and it will commence in the 2022-2023 school year. They will begin removing Redskins from athletic facilities, the school, the apparel. They are not going to change the Native American curriculum that they teach at the school. And if you've ever been to Wichita North High School, you know that there's a lot of Native American imagery. It's a really beautiful high school with the Native American uh, imagery on the bridge leading up to Wichita North and and carved all around the school. They're going to keep that. They have not made any indication as to what the replacement mascot will be, but starting next year, it it would appear that this will be the last season of the Wichita North Redskins. And and Tommy, they had a lot of comment on this, both for and against. And I know from a lot of North High alums, they they will tell me once a Redskin, always a Redskin, but it's hard to imagine a world in which the Washington Redskins no longer exist and a high school could keep that nickname and and mascot. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, Regardless of the motivations behind it, regardless of the reasoning uh, to to make the change, uh, at the end of the day, it was just hard for me to think that there would be any scenario where that nickname was going to be kept. Whether or not they made that decision for you know, whatever reason you, you want to throw out there. Um, the, the bottom line is that you have a, a, a national football league franchise that I guess you could say cave to the pressure or at least made a change, decided to make an adjustment. If you've got that going on and that's a, that's a multi-million dollar change. I mean, that they affects have that every for years. facet of this yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it affects everything. It's hard for me to think that a, a, a local high school um, was going to be able to keep that mascot. So I get it. I understand it. It's not, uh, I'm sure for the alumni, it's not fun. It's not easy. They probably disagree with that change, but it was one that I just, I thought was probably inevitable. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really have a lot to add here too, but I, I think a point that you made Blake was, you know, especially after following, you know, the Washington franchise that like you said, fought it for so long. I mean, they were the ones that just were adamant that they weren't going to do it. Um, you know, it's different than if it would have been, you know, just this organization that was, you know, people are trying to say, Oh, you know, that they're always trying to do the, the woke thing. I mean, that's the word that gets used. Right. Um, but this, I mean, this wasn't that this was Washington who fought it so long. And when you, you, you just kind of knew once they said, okay, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and move on from this. We're going to change. That's when, you know, all the, the smaller suits, and I'm sure there's more than just North high in Wichita, Kansas, that's using the Redskins, you know, liberal name. high school would be one of them in liberal you know, Kansas. Forgot, forgot about that one just within our state of Kansas, but I was just thinking across the, the nation as a whole, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, in due time that, that that'll probably be a, a sweeping move and, and eventually it'll probably all be gone. I'm not sure if it's your favorite part of the show, but it is that time of the show. Tommy hit the music. It is time for the Wichita whip around where we bring you one story from the air capital in sports that you probably need to know. And today we will be starting with Tommy Castor. What is your story today for the whip around? Well, so I'm going to be a rebel. I actually have two stories that I want to bring you. And uh, so it's up to you. I can do both of them at the same time or I can do one and you will do Weston and then we'll go back to you for your second one. But, But go ahead with your first one. Okay, so my first one is a shout out to the Wichita Thunder hockey team. We talked about them a few weeks ago and about, you know, they had a COVID shutdown and what things looked like coming out of that COVID shutdown. They've played some really good hockey ever since they came out of that shutdown. They are five and two in the seven games since they came out of that shutdown, including taking two of three at home from Rapid City and then taking two of three against Allen uh, as well. So their record currently sets at 11, four and one. They are on the road for a, a pretty long road trip this weekend and then again next weekend they play at utah this weekend and then next weekend on the road at tulsa before they're back home again versus kansas city on sunday february 21st so i've got a story boys for wichita prep basketball here in wichita 
Um, it's a team that we don't talk about a lot, even though they are just all over the national scene. That Sunrise Christian Academy out of Bel Air. Yeah. Um, they, let's see, in, uh, it was last Friday night. They beat number one ranked, and this is nationally number one ranked Montverde Academy, uh, who has had the all sorts of, of NBA stars have gone through Mount Verde. Verde. Um, but they ended Mount Verde's 44 game winning streak, and that's with uh, number three Sunrise. They rallied from a nine point deficit in the fourth fourth quarter uh, in big part by KU target Grady, Grady Dick, who's actually a w- Wichita native. Um, he hit, let's see, he hit a three with, I want to say it was 8.3 seconds remaining in, in regulation, which took the, the deficit down to 56 to 55. Mount Verde comes down and hits, they hit two free throws. And then Tennessee signee Kenny, Kennedy Chandler, who had 19 points on the game, uh, he hit at the game tying three as time expired to force it, uh, force the game into overtime, which the, then Sunrise went ahead and, and took over and, and won that game in overtime. So uh, this Sunrise Christian Academy, they have been all over the national scene for, I don't know, I'll say the last 10 years. I don't know if that feels about right to you guys for me to say about the last 10 years. But, boy, they uh, they are playing some good basketball there at uh, out of Bel Air. Tommy, story number two. Yeah, so I, I don't want to end the Wichita whip around on a downer, and I know we've talked about a couple of losses already on the program, but this week has just been kind of crazy with the, the number of people in the sports world that we have lost, and there have been two deaths in the last couple of days that have connections to Wichita State University that I want to mention. So Texas Rio Grande Valley coach Lou Hill passed away on Super Bowl Sunday. It was a day after coaching what was his final game. He was 55 years old. The cause of death was not known, although some people have cited COVID-19 complications. Lou Hill played basketball at Wichita State University under Eddie Fogler in the 1980s and was an assistant coach for the Shockers. So he passed away over the weekend. And then uh, this just came down in the last 24 hours. Wichita State football legend, former quarterback Prince Mitt Juggins, has died at the age of 60 and reports indicate that his death was COVID related as well. He was quarterback for the Shockers from the years 1979 to 1982, the first player in NCAA history to finish his career with at least 2,000 yards rushing and 4,000 yards passing during his senior season with Wichita State football. He accounted for 21 touchdowns, 10 on the ground, and another 11 through the air. So Prince McJunkins has passed away at the age of 60 again. He played football, played quarterback for the Wichita State Shocker football team from 1979 to 1982. And actually, that that was my story. I was going to be a melancholy Wichita whip around for me, talking about McJunkins and Hill. And Hill scored 14 points per game, shot 45% from the three-point line as a senior. Shockers made the NCAA tournament that year. And Prince McJunkins, being that dual-threat quarterback at that time in college football, was something that really nobody had ever seen before. So if you want to look at at Lamar Jackson at being this dual-threat guy, uh, even before a guy like Cordell Stewart kind of popularized being slash and throwing the ball, running the ball at Colorado, being able to do everything. McJunkins was doing it at Cessna Stadium for Wichita State. And and obviously, I was also going to toss in Marty Schottenheimer, the eighth winningest coach in NFL history. Tommy brought him up earlier. The only coach with 200 or more regular season wins, not in the Hall of Fame, 101 and 58 in Kansas City, also spent time, of course, most famously with the Browns, had a couple of great years with San Diego and one year with the Redskins. And uh, Schottenheimer should be in the NFL Hall of Fame. Get him in. So that is our Wichita whip around. Absolutely. Sadly, sadly, a little bit of a, of a, of a, uh, a melancholy Wichita whip around. Fellas, do we have any corrections, additions, or retractions before we wrap up the show today? I've got an addition. That way we can kind of end. I don't know. We've probably turned off the Wichita whip around music, but I'll, I've got a Wichita story that will end on a good note here. And sure. boys, I'm going to go. I'm going to take this podcast somewhere where we've never taken this podcast. Women's cross country. How about okay. that? I'm Didn't fine. It? I'm fine with that. So which country? Where are they running in cross country right now? Don't they know it's like two degrees outside? 
it's miserable, but uh, those runners, they, it doesn't make any difference. They just run. It's crazy. I don't, I don't like to run even when it's 75 and sunny, but that's just for, <laughs> that's for another podcast. So Wichita State senior Winnie, and I think it's Koski, became the first runner, male or female, to win three cross-country championships in the American Athletic Conference on Saturday as she, let's see, had a winning time of 20 minutes, 49 seconds, on her home six kilometer course at Four Mile Creek Resort in Augusta. So she becomes the first runner, male or female, in AAC history to win three cross country individual championships. So, so shout out to Wichita State senior Winnie Koski. And they, apparently they're still going to have NCAA championships at Correct. the level because it says that they, she punched her ticket to it. That is insane that they're running in in February. That's that absolutely blows my mind. Um, but that no way to get that story. And Tommy, any uh, additions or retractions or corrections from you today? Yeah, a quick addition, just because I thought of it when you guys were talking about sports and the weather that we're experiencing outside. Uh, I saw a photo on Twitter. I saw a photo on Twitter today from Wichita State Baseball, and the guys are out playing catch today, and it's like six degrees outside, and there's snow on the ground, and they're in their baseball uniforms, and they're they're throwing the ball around. And so uh, absolute dedication. I know I've, I've talked before about how much I enjoy – going to X stadium in February for early season, Wichita state baseball. It's going to have to warm up a little bit before I'm willing to go out there and watch a game. I don't know if either of you, either of you guys played baseball in high school, but I, I will say, I don't know if there is a worse feeling than when you make solid contact with a baseball <laughs> in late February, early March, when you're practicing baseball and not that my bat made a lot of contact with any baseballs in general, <laughs> but I can tell you the few times it did when it was cold, that is a pain like none other. I'd see, I would argue that you didn't make solid contact. If you hit it clean, you don't, there's no pain. <laughs> If you hit it off the handle, though, ooh, brutal. Um, by the way, the Wichita State softball team did release their schedule today. They're going to start the season down in Arlington, Texas at the Maverick Classic on February 19th, and they will have their home opener against Creighton on February 27th. Uh, the Newman baseball uh, home opener, which was scheduled for this week, has been pushed back due to the weather and the Newman softball team. I'm sure friends as well, uh, obviously, there ain't going to be no diamond sports played this week in Wichita. So uh, it's too bad, but that's that's the way it is. So that is our show for this week. Once again, next week on the show, we're going to have a lot of Kansas State basketball talk, talking about the future of Bruce Weber, apparently going to be the head coach at Wichita State, or beg your pardon, at Kansas State University. Fellas, where can the people find you on social media? Tommy, we'll start with you. Well, of course, you can see it right below on the screen. But in case you uh, you're listening, uh, you can dear follow me. Audio listeners, exactly. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at tweets from Tommy. You can find me at W Mills ninety four. And I'm at B E C R I P P S B E Crips. Once again, you can follow the show, cogsports.com. We're at cogpod on Twitter. So reach out, interact with us, and cogpod.podomatic.com. And if you if you like the show, share it with a friend. Uh, it helps us out. We really appreciate it. That is our show for this week. Uh, officially, guys, we have wrapped up Chiefs football and football for the year. Uh, are, how are you guys queasy about this? Are you going to go into withdrawal? I, I'm fine. I'm happy to start watching some Australian Open tennis. Looking forward to the Masters in April and obviously college basketball. I'm fine without football for a few months, but I'm guessing, Weston, I'm guessing this is a painful time of sports year for you. Blake, you might not be surprised to know this, or maybe you will be, but I swear to you on my mama, I have actually already started a mock draft. I'm not kidding. I oh have I have, a, I have a spreadsheet <laughs> for my mock draft that already has a few teams filled out. I'm not kidding you. <sighs> Hey, the the good thing for me, like I, I'm gonna miss football, but pitchers and catchers report in two weeks, so I think true. I'll be okay. Royals baseball be around around the corner, so that'll be very exciting. That is our show for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, we'll see you, Keeper of the Games podcast. Have a good one, guys. Take care, guys. You've been listening to Keeper of the Games with Tommy Caster, Weston Mills, and Blake Cripps. Don't forget to subscribe, download, and listen on all major podcast platforms 
like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Visit our website at cogsports.com. Find the podcast and videos on Facebook and YouTube at Keeper of the Games. And follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at CogPod. That's K-O-G-Pod.